Well, good morning. I'm uh, pleased to be here again. And uh, I had been asked to speak about this topic at an agribusiness conference in, in Columbus, and uh, I'm sharing much of the same uh, presentation. So um, 2019 has been very challenging. So I come from Pennsylvania, and we were not nearly hit as bad as you guys were here in Ohio. But uh, last year, uh, actually it was not only Ohio, but uh, last year I actually visited uh, Michigan, and I drove in June, at the, I think it was, I drove through northern Ohio and to Michigan, and it was just a little bit mind-boggling to see all the fields unplanted, so many fields unplanted, and farmers here and there, you saw an occasional tractor in the field trying to do something. <laughs> It was very depressing, and uh, well, we know that that led to some major uh, effects. So, this is that from August, the uh, prevent planting uh, map, <clears throat> and last year was the the record, absolute record in prevent planting, 20 million acres in the United States. <clears throat> now, you guys didn't come in right at uh, first place, but just after South Dakota. <clears throat> so South Dakota had uh, the winning prize with 3.9 million acres of uh, prevent planting, and in Ohio it was uh, 1.6 million, and Illinois behind. A lot of it was corn and also some soybeans. So <clears throat> that, that led to a lot of acres remaining unplanted, uh, and also some acres were still planted in cover crops, but uh, you know, it's kind of a new experience to have a, a field sitting idle for a whole year and having nothing in it. What that's like, I had not really ever really paid that much attention to something like that. And uh, that started some new thoughts about what is the impl are the implications of that. But not all uh, acres were uh, enrolled in prevent planning. Perhaps some of this happened as well. Uh, you still were trying to do something. And here's farmer, I guess he's trying to dry out his soil. <laughs> do, perhaps he got cabin fever. I hear we are getting cold March this year, is what I heard. So I was looking forward to it getting warmer and, and I'm sure I'm gonna get cabin fever. That's gonna be for sure. <laughs> because I like to play soccer and, uh, when I can't get out there, it's another snowstorm in March, I, I get cabin fever. But this guy probably got cabin fever because he wanted to get out there in the field. And he just pulled the tractor out and do something. But what are you doing? What are, you, what are, are the re results? <clears throat> or something like this. This was actually in Michigan. I was there visiting with uh, Jer Jerry Grigar, their uh, state agronomist, now retired. But he showed me this field and this farmer had just gone back and forth tilling and we, we, uh, he pulled out the penetrometer and, uh, it was very wet, but this penetrometer went way into the red on the 300 psi range, which is the root limiting because underneath, underneath that tillage, he had caused a lot of compaction. Now, uh, one, one new issue that has come up, and yes, it was a very interesting presentation by one of your Ohio State Extension uh, educators about this whole issue of prevent planting. So that is something new when you um, have no crop in the field for a whole year and no, no, you know, we're starting to appreciate more the importance of the living root system and the living crops for our soils, well, when you don't have that for a whole year, you run into some issues. Here you see um, this corn being so so low, so small, is because, uh, and this much taller, there was soybeans here the year before, but over there they never got to planting the soybeans, so the corn was like um, way shorter. Uh, that is uh, attributed to the effect of the, of the reduction in mycorrhizae. Uh, I think we are now becoming more aware of the importance of mycorrhizae, but here it was showing very significantly uh, the effect. That can also lead to things like this, where you get phosphorus deficiency. Um, phosphorus, if you don't have 
high levels of phosphorus or, you know, phosphorus is an interesting nutrient because the, the, I always say the roots have to find it. Uh, there can be tons of phosphorus in the soil, but the roots need to get it. Otherwise, you can still have phosphorus deficiency. I mean, even if your soil test levels are appropriate, well, if you have a no mycorrhizae and the phosphorus is perhaps somewhat, um, might be optimal or on the low side, the mycorrhizae become very important also to help with uptake of phosphorus. And so if you have a reduction in mycorrhizal population, that can uh, cause these kind of symptoms. I'm not sure how long this lasts. I often see these phosphorus deficiencies, they kind of go away over time, I guess, when as the root system uh, develops, the plant kind of compensates, but I do think it can uh, eventually affect also the crop yield. Now, uh, not all, pla all cover, not all uh, prevent planted acres were devoid of vegetation. It was really a big push trying to, far to stimulate the farmers to plant cover crops, but I guess not everybody got to it because only 20% of the prevent planted acres were actually planted to cover crop. But I think now perhaps this was a wake up year for us and we're starting to realize that we should really do this. If you cannot plant anything, it would have been much better to have a cover crop there. You know, we have gotten so stuck in a rut with this corn soybean system, I think. Uh, and uh, we, got, we got a wake, wake up call last year where we have to get all our work done in that short little tiny window in the spring and we have no flexibility anymore and uh, well this is the result now if you if you not any cover crop will do either because if you grow brassica cover crops only if you who had used only brassica then those brassica cover crops are not a uh, help they don't host mycorrhizae so um, that would not have helped you any. And I actually think there might be a reduction due to the, these brassica cover crops. This was some research from a uh, colleague of mine at Penn State. He did a lot of work. He's now moved to um, Utah. But um, he did work on uh, the effect of canola in the crop rotation on the mycorrhizal population in the soil. So he had canola followed by a wheat cover crop. Uh, canola followed by a fallow, uh, soybeans followed by wheat, and soybeans with uh, fallow. So this is the uh, colonization of the of the mycorrhizae on the roots, the percent of the root length colonized by mycorrhizae, and you can see a, a significant reduction. And after the canola, compared to the soybeans, and Unfortunately, the, the wheat didn't even help to compensate for that, the wheat cover crop after the canola. So that, that mycorrhizal population was really reduced. This is then the effect on maize shoot nitrogen percentage. So the nitrogen uptake was reduced. And also this is the phosphorus uptake of the phosphorus percentage in the plants. Um, that was lower than where we followed soybeans. And this is the dry weight of the, of the shoots of some early um, the, the young corn plants. So significantly reduced. And this actually had an, a significant effect on the yield. I don't have the yield data here. But just to show you that uh, we recommend really using mixtures of cover crops and uh, there are lots of benefits to these brassica cover crops, but this is one of the things why we recommend uh, mixtures. Because if you would have other cover crops there that do host mycorrhizae, you would not run into this issue. Um, now, I showed this slide yesterday also, but uh, I, today I'm actually, going, in this talk, I'm going to talk a lot about tillage, which is not my favorite topic, uh, but for when you have your soils very uh, messed up, you, you may need to do something. But nonetheless, I wanted to emphasize the benefits of the continuous no-till system. 
So this was research, and you know, I always uh, equate somewhat our permanent no-till with having living roots in the soil with a, that of a, a, a permanent pasture, okay? And this was the research from the Netherlands where they contrasted the number of days you could get in the field on a permanent pasture compared to a, um, a crop land field that was managed with moldboard plowing. So um, because of the, re the poor soil structure in that crop field and then a plow pan, that soil was sitting wet much longer than in the permanent pasture. And therefore, they were not able to get into that field m uh, many days of the month. Here in January, only like seven days. This is in the Netherlands, so you need to remember in the Netherlands, it's further north, but because it is a sea climate, it's very mild winters and uh, drizzly rain, and it sits and not a lot of frost, so the soil is not frozen, and so the soil just sits there wet, just like what we have right now here in Northwest Ohio. And uh, but because this soil drains so much better, you you have many more days that you can actually get in there, and that is just uh, amazing. And in no tillage, we are experiencing that too, that w our soils are better drained due to a lot of different things. It's the surface structure. It's also all those night crawler burrows that help us with drainage. And so we can get in it. And actually, I found some interesting uh, how that affected last year to prevent planting acres in South Dakota. But um, here you see the the effect of these different types of management. This was that crop, crop land with moldboard plowing. Uh, they, they analyzed the, the pore size distribution and um, you have a, a nice range in a well-structured pasture. But in a, the plow pan on the crop field, all the large pores had disappeared. So we get a, this kind of situation where the water just stands in the fields. Now, they also had tried to remediate it with subsoiling, but then went back to their old ways of moldboard plowing. And now the, the plow pan actually packed down to tighter, and they had fewer fewer pore spaces even than when they did uh, before they were subsoiling, because they didn't do anything different. So, point I want to make, if you do tillage to remediate or repair your soil, you also need to think, what do I do to build soil structure? Because the tillage only breaks the soil structure up. It doesn't build soil structure. So we need to work then with, with our uh, root systems to build that soil structure back up. And also try to then go into continuous no-tillage, I would say. So this was the data from uh, South Dakota. They looked at the percent prevent planting and uh, split it up by different tillage systems. And you see that the, the farmers that were in permanent no-till, there was a lot less prevent planted, planted acres. So you can, you can set yourself up for success by transitioning uh, to a, a permanent no-till system, is I think what I would like to suggest. Um, this is also interesting. This is here from Hoytville, uh, research from their compaction uh, trial. Randall sh shared this with me. Um, <clears throat> in 2002, this uh, trial was converted to no-till. It used to be chisel plow, but n then they went to no-till. They compact this with a grain cart with 20-ton axle load, and also <coughs> another one is 10-ton uh, axle load. But uh, then they, they, they express, the yields are expressed as a percentage of the control where it was not compacted. So there's also 10 ton X load. So this is the, the crop yield after uh, compaction with the 20 ton X load. Uh, but then they also use subsoiling, which we would think would improve the situation, but actually the subsoiled yields were lower. The, the reduction of the yield was I asked um, Alan Sundermeyer, because I unfortunately have never been able to be at this this trial. I would love to see this and learn more about this. But um, 
he said, I think it is because this, the subsoiling is done in the fall and uh, it's often too wet to do subsoiling. And uh, you end up with very cloudy uh, surface soil. And so that is why this is, this is compaction and you don't do any tillage. It's permanent no-till now. Here, this one, this blue line. So they compacted it here. This is the 15% yield reduction with 20 ton axle load. And that's, that's compacted two times. And they want over every inch of the field. I think it is pretty amazing that you only get a 10, 15% uh, yield reduction, you know, without doing anything. And the subsoiling didn't improve anything because I think it was just too wet. And the subsoiling, by the way, was done every year. Uh, so here, they, they weren't doing the compaction every year. Here's compaction again. Now here, the, the yield drop was much lo larger, 20 or 35 percent, but the subsoiling made it worse. I think the soil became just so cloddy and uh, probably they bring up big, big uh, blocks of soil. And then you have a lot of open spaces, I assume. And here it was compacted again. This is in soybeans. Now in corn, it's, it's actually in corn. Uh, this was worse than in corn. Soybeans seem to be just as sensitive to compaction as uh, corn. But just to, a warning that tillage needs to be done at the right time. Uh, much, the, the, the importance of roots is so, cannot overemphasize it. This was, um, our research that we did with, uh, rye that was killed early or late and we measured bulk density in the summer in July. And we saw a significant reduction where we had the taller rye that we killed larger because of, I attribute that to the root system. That was, this was all in no-till. This is a picture from a dairy farm we've been working with over the years who really struggled with continuous no-till until he included this rye cover crop in his rotation. This is from the soil from under a manure spreader, big manure spreader tire track. And uh, here, there was no cover crop. And that is what we're talking about here. The difference is that that root system causing that structure to be... First, there is that, that roots act as a, um, as a geotextile, I like to uh, compare it with. It just offers protection against compaction when you have that whole fibrous root system underneath. But uh, it also helps to remediate compaction because the roots are growing. So even after you went over it with your manure spreader, those roots are also continuing to expand. And of course, they also feed a lot of other soil organisms. So it is a whole system, and, and it's really one of the things to keep in mind. Here's uh, some different examples. This is hairy vetch in the summer, hairy vetch in no-till. <laughs> And here we have an annual ryegrass cover crop. And just think about the roots that are underneath. This is research from uh, Purdue. And they show that the soil structure was significantly better where they had a uh, cover crop compared to no cover. You know, that's just some data to support what I was just saying. Um, a cover crop management can also help. So this is a work that we had a PhD student. She worked on planting green and compared it to killing cover crop two weeks before planting. She monitored the soil moisture content. This is the soil moisture content in planting green. Uh, it was planted at this time. So the moisture content was lower because that, that green cover crop sucks up moisture when it's growing and also the, the roots that's not reflected here, but the roots make this, this structure better to enable you to get in the field earlier. Uh, compared to where you killed that cover crop two weeks earlier, well, that cover crop is now dead, a dead mulch on the soil surface, and it conserves moisture. But at that time, you want to get in the field, so that's not a positive if it's too wet. Now then, you see, then after you kill that that cover crop here, this, this planted green was killed after planting, um, one or two days after planting. Then that becomes a dead mulch on the soil surface. And in the summer, it was the reverse. Now it, because there's a thick mat of crop residue now, it conserves the moisture. 
And so in the summer, when we often have drought uh, stress, it is actually uh, a positive. <clears throat> Cover crops can also be used to, to repair compaction. And uh, there's a lot of words here on this slide, but this was a um, trial from Maryland where they uh, looked at different types of cover crops and how the, the type of cover crop affects the ability uh, of growing in a compacted soil. So they compacted the soil with a, um, I think it was 12 and a half, 13 ton, um, in a high compaction, 13 ton um, axle load and, and 14 tons. Uh, so they, they first subsoiled the field then they compacted it, and they created three levels of compaction that way, high, medium, and no compaction. And then they grew three different types of cover crops. One was radishes, one was uh, rape, and one was rye. And uh, then they took cores from that uh, soil in, um, I think it was in November or December, so late fall. And they, they broke the cores open, and then looked for roots and counted the roots inside to a depth of 25 inches. And that's what you see here, or 20 inches. You can see I'm still having trouble with those English units. Uh, in, this is centimeters. It's so much easier. But anyway, you still have to deal with those inches. But here uh, we have the roots. This is in the high compaction here, first year and then the second year. They didn't recompact it. Um, but um, the roots were, these are the reddish roots this year. They found significantly the highest number of roots going to 20 inches in that high compaction uh, with the reddishes. Uh, the rye is the lowest here. Then in between you have rape. And uh, that was still carrying on into the second year. Now you compare that where there was no compaction that difference didn't really show up. Uh, the rye, so this is the reddish now. Now the reddishes, they seem to have fewer roots near the soil surface uh, and, and fewer fine roots. The, the, that fibrous root system of the rye, uh, let's see that I say that correctly, yes. So these triangles is rye, so we have more fibrous roots near the soil surface with rye but then uh, in the subsoil, there was no difference really be between the uh, radishes or, or rapes or um, any of them, basically the same. But in the compacted soil, they found more of those reddish roots. So it seems the, the authors were reminiscing about what causes this difference. Um, of course, uh, now this was planted in on a timely manner, so I think it was late August. So that's important, and you know how aggressive the radishes grow in the fall, very aggressively grown. So that root system also develops very aggressively. But uh, that tap root, and that tap root is thick only to perhaps 12 inches or so. After that, it becomes uh, much thinner, but it's still a tap root. They, uh, they attribute that to less friction of tap roots with the soil because it's thicker and then also less buckling. So I think these, this study I found interesting because it helps us with thinking about how we use car different types of cover crops to alleviate something like soil compaction. So not something for this spring, but perhaps something to think about for uh, the fall. Oh, this was uh, that study, an another study on radishes, but they installed uh, transparent tubes in the soil and then uh, put little cameras in there and then they were able to keep track of where the roots were that they had found. This was a reddish root. On this side you see the reddish roots and then here this was in the summer. This now is a soybean root growing through that very channel that was created by that reddish and over here too. Just uh, actually this was canola, sorry, but you get the message, isn't it? So. You, you, another point here is this is in the fall when the soil is more moist and this is in the summer when the soil is dry. Those soybean roots are going to have a more difficult time growing in that soil because it's much more of the time it's 
is hard, uh, dry and hard. So this uh, softer soil is also more accessible for roots. So by using this roots in the fall to create channels, and then in the in the summer we can benefit from them with our summer crops. Um, yeah, and there's many practices in no tillage, but we are steering towards something like this, uh, where we have such a crumbly soil structure at the surface, and then in the subsoil we have tons of burrows from night crawlers. Here they're all coated with organic matter, and in permanent no tillage we have a lots of those night crawlers, but in conventional tillage where we don't have any residue at the soil surface, uh, we don't have many of those. And you see these roots often, they are usually uh, concentrated in those night crawler burrows. Uh, here is an example of what you see at the soil surface. I always lo love to look for night crawlers. And if you are, have a, a, a soybean field from last year, go out there and see all the little mounds that they have collected above their burrow. You move away that little mound with uh, crop residue, and underneath you will see a pencil-sized ho hole, and you know underneath there that this goes perhaps four or five feet deep. And those, burrow, those, those mounds are typically about a foot apart, or roughly. They have a little territory, I guess. Uh, they need a little space between them, but uh, you can have so many of those uh, in an acre, and uh, lots of water can infiltrate through them and makes your soil, the soil structure has a, a very diff, uh, important effect on it. Here you see a fresh cast. So these night trawlers, they gather that crop residue near their burrow, then that starts to become all mushy and soft, then they can eat it. Then they, they move down, up and down in their burrow, depending on the, the weather conditions uh, and the moisture conditions in the soil. But uh, they digest and they mix it with some soil in their gut, and uh, then they excrete that at the soil surface. And when you analyze these, these uh, casts, now they, when they are fresh, they're, they're still very soft. But then when they dry up, they become stable aggregates. And when you analyze them for nutrient content, you find that they have all kinds of things that are beneficial, like higher organic matter content and higher nutrient contents. So those casts are uh, very important for maintaining surface soil structure and uh, a reason why we find that better aggregation near the soil in permanent no tillage. Now, <clears throat> now I want to transition a little bit and talk about uh, using tillage to alleviate compaction uh, if you have a problem and uh, to evaluate your soil to see if you need to do any tillage. So this was a uh, review that was done several years ago based on a compilation of a lot of tillage studies where they used <coughs> different types of subsoiling or surface tillage to alleviate soil compaction. This is from the UK study, and, um, but the research came from many different places. So they concluded, based on this, that uh, many times shallow operations are sufficient. Uh, 12 to 14 inches depth uh, losing operations may be enough. Deeper subsoiling, it's many, in my many trials, they didn't find it to be very, um, very beneficial. They had here a three-year subsoiling study that was replicated in 16 sites in the UK. They found no yield improvement due to that due to the subsoiling, except on a compacted sandy soil with spring planting. So there you see so many different trials and yet very few uh, improvements of the yield due to the subsoiling. In uh, this North American review, subsoiling also failed to show yield improvement in many cases. Now they did uh, comment that if there is drought stress in the summer, then that subsoiling may have a positive effect. On the other hand, clay soils that have a shrink swell action may actually repair themselves. So I think that is what you have over here. Much of what you have is shrink shrink swell soils with uh, you. So you have it. It starts to crack when it dries up. 
And those cracks then become again entry points for roots to go through, grow through. And kind of that soil repairs itself. That is actually that type of soil what I showed you for that Hoytville uh, trial. So perhaps that is a reason why we don't see a benefit of subsoiling on that soil if we have a uh, use continuous no-till. Now, before you start doing tillage, uh, remember all the negatives of tillage. It buries red residue, increases the soil uh, exposure to erosion. And when you do tillage, my goal is always try to keep the residue at the soil surface, at least 30%. But that's not so easy when you start doing anything in the field. Typically, many times you don't keep it at 30%. Another um, point to remember is that tillage burns up organic matter. I always love that um, research from Don Rykowski where they measured the CO2 that em was emitted from the soil just after tillage. They had a, a chamber and then they measured the CO2. Of course, we can't smell CO2, we can't see it, so it's hard for us to imagine. But they found that there, there were just big amounts of CO2 released very shortly after tillage in a, a matter of days. Uh, a lot of CO2 was um, just released. Um, and the more you disturb the soil, the deeper and the, the rougher it set, the more CO2 was released. That is that effect of churning up. It's like churning up the, the fire, uh, stirring the fire and the coals. And there, you get oxygen there, burns up the organic matter. Tillage also destroys soil structure. It har harms biological activity. And uh, it it's causes the soils to become more sensitive to compaction and rutting afterwards. Uh, negatives, especially in uh, where we have continuous no tillage, and uh, perhaps grassland soils, uh, you know the moldboard plow would just develop because uh, of the prairie soils. You know, uh, John Deere developed or really developed a moldboard plow, the steel moldboard plow, because it was so hard to get that soil in shape with the rudimentary tillage tools that they had in those days. Well, the moldboard is, is effective in, in addressing some of these things, but the still there is a risk of clod problems, um, the soil support and Pugging, they call it when you have animals, the, the, the pugging of the feet of the animals. Here we have this, this was a long-term no-till soil and we subsoiled it and uh, we sank in ter terribly when we did the, our compaction treatments while on the, on the permanent no-tillage we made small indentations, not even an inch deep. But this is just showing you the, 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 the effect that tillage has on soil support and recompaction. And then you do damage to all those natural root and earthworm channels. And also, uh, of course, if you do it when you have a living cover crop there, that cover crop or sod will be damaged. But nonetheless, what do you do when you have a situation like this? I ran into this. I was in, uh, in Delaware. This field had been harvested for silage. And this fellow had been in there, and this whole field looked like that. Now, what do you do? <laughs> Total destruction. This is a custom harvester, and uh, you know that's uh, this sometimes what we end up with. What do you do now? You cannot go in there and do no tillage. That's no way. So I say you need to level the field. I've run into a lot of problems with my fields not being even in no-till. I have a trial at our research farm that's actually, I'm trying to do no-till vegetables. But this field was in beds in the past. And uh, I guess I didn't really um, appreciate those beds so much. So we kind of just went in there, started doing no-tillage. Well, there was little tiny, tiny waves, little uh, bumps in the field. And I'm finding after years, I'm still sometimes having problems with drilling my cover crops. When you have to shallowly seed the, the crops with the drill, then, uh, well, on, even if there's a little bump there, the seeds get planted perhaps an inch deep or, or an inch and a half. And then uh, next to it, they get dropped on the soil surface. 
So then I get uneven stands of my cover crops. So I find it, when you think about this, make sure you level it properly so your drill can work. The planters are much more forgiving, so you don't have to worry that much about it. Actually, it might be a consideration. I, I know some farmers, they, uh, they first plant corn uh, for a few years because they, with the planter they can deal with roughness uh, better than with, um, in our environment, a lot of our farms, they use drill to plant soybeans. So uh, they don't, perhaps, it might be one consideration to think about. You don't need as much evenness for the planter. Um, another point that I would like to make is, you know, here, their water is standing in those ruts. So apparently that has been compacted quite severely. You need to reopen those macropores somehow. I think it is beneficial. I don't think it would be enough to just smoothen this all out. I don't know, but it, over time it would heal, but it might take a while. So I would say I would like to break this up in those bottoms of those ruts. So you need to make sure you get deep enough. I'm saying a lot of things here based on my experience, perhaps not so much. It's more an art than a science, I have to say. It's not really a, and you guys may have a lot of criticism of what I say, and that's fine. Just offering a few thoughts for consideration, and you take it home and do with it what you want. Uh, yes, the other point is try to do minimal loosening and aggregate rearrangement. That was one other thing that those guys from the UK came up with. Um, so when you do a lot of inversion tillage, you do a lot of rearrangement of the aggregates, and that is really not what you are after. You're just trying to open some um, some spaces there, some some mac some pore spaces for roots to grow through. Uh, yeah, in the bottom of the ruts, and then try to limit the tillage depth, so you don't need to go really much lower than just breaking this up much deeper than that you don't really need to go uh, and then try to conserve crop residue and there are a lot of things you can do actually with your tillage to avoid just having that soil become completely bare so if you have a field with with that rotting up field what do you do these are just some suggestions again based on my experiences is the rutting limited to a few areas of the field? For example, 10 to 20 percent. Well, then localized remediation may be enough. Like over here, these are the headlands only, basically, and you only have to uh, uh, do something here. I think it's not worthwhile to to do that in the whole field. Um, how deep are the ruts? Perhaps there are only small ruts. Uh, or uh, not even really ruts, but just indentations, only one inch deep, perhaps no further action may be needed, dependent on your planting equipment, I guess. Perhaps leveling of the field is enough. Then, if that is enough, and you don't see severe compaction in the bottom of the ruts, uh, you can just use a shallow type of tillage equipment, like a field cultivator, or a shallow disking if you don't have that. I, I like the field cultivator better because it brings crop residue to the soil surface and keeps it on top, while disk kind of inc incorporates it more. But you might not have a field cultivator, so shallow disking might also be enough. On the other hand, if this, there is a lot of compaction in the deep depth of the ruts, uh, you may need to bust up the soil there and you may need to do some deep tillage. Then you need to follow that, of course, by a leveling operation. Here are some suggestions about how to determine how deep to till. I use a penetrometer here, and we analyzed penetration resistance. This was uh, no tillage. In, this was from our compaction trial. We analyzed the penetration resistance, and this is in pounds per square inch. You know, 300 is like the critical level. That's when the gauge gets red. Uh, because based on root research in the past, most root systems are not able to grow in that kind of a compacted soil if it is completely uniform. Um, so you see here in our compacted no-till, we had a zone there where it seemed to be 
very high and then it went, came back down. And this was the, um, uncompacted, con this is the uncompacted control. This is also no tillage, but not compacted. So you see a big difference here in terms of the penetration resistance. But it is a two about this depth. So this is, uh, about 12 inches deep. Below that, there is not really a big difference. Um, now, we did use a zone tillage operation. This is uh, zone till. And you see that kind of went probably deep enough. Um, this is our subsoiler, which is to, to 17 inches. It loosened the soil to, uh, to that depth, but was it really necessary? Because the soil functionality was good over here. In the process, we made this soil very soft and weak. And so that is where we got that truck stuck because our soil support was reduced. So really, I don't think we should have used that very deep tillage. We could just have gone to 12 inches. Now, our zone tillage actually was a zone tillage cart, which uh, that's not the most effective with just those coulters. Um, so it would have been better to use something more, um, a bit more uh, solid. Types of tillage is also uh, something to think about, the types of subsoilers. So research has shown that when you use these kinds of shanks, sub or parabolic shanks, they uh, here, they, there's no coulter. If you have residue there, it starts to drag corn stalks, for example, can start to drag corn stalks, although these, these are spaced quite widely, so perhaps it's not a problem. But what you get is you, you roll the soil over. And so when you go through this, many, especially if the soil is compacted, you get a lot of clods at the soil surface, and then you have to do all kinds of secondary tillage to, to bust the clods up. So these, uh, these straight shank um, subsoilers, they do much more just fracturing below the soil surface, and they don't, they don't um, disturb the soil surface. Uh, and also, they have... Um, they have coulters here to cut through residue, so you keep the residue in place. And these have only um, straight or narrow points. Um, there's two different schools there that I've come to recognize. Some subsolars are made with a straight, uh, a, a narrow point and a, a narrow shank. All of these have narrow shanks. But uh, here the idea is to just open a slot that then is accessible for roots to grow through. They don't really mean to do a lot of fracturing uh, beyond that. This one here, it has a, um, a winged tip. And when you run behind that, you see the soil comes just up like a wave behind, uh, even between those, those, uh, those shanks, you see a wave that the soil is lifted and that it fractured the soil even between the shanks. So it causes much more below ground fracturing. Uh, and, and really, the aim is to fracture the whole subsoil. Um, now here, they have these wheels berm, called berm tuckers. And uh, these are important, too, because they keep the soil from, from blowing out behind the shank. Uh, if you get a lot of blowout, again, your soil sits all rough and you have to do secondary tillage to smoothen the, the field. Here also they have coulters up front. So you have coulters to cut residue, and then you have these that cause fracturing below the soil surface, and these berm tuckers too. And to have them next to the shank is beneficial because it reduces the blowout the most. Here are some other setups. Uh, again, a coulter here, a straight shank, narrow point, there they use these coulters to um, create a seed bed, basically, because here they do have the blowout, so you get clods there, a lot of cloudiness, and then these uh, attachments are meant to, to break up those clods. And to, here there's an, a, a little roller there that um, breaks up those, those clods to make a seed bed. Supposed to be a one-pass operation that you can just plant at, afterwards. Here's another example, and you see here the, the blowout, they, these clots here. Similar setup with um, this kind of a, a roller. 
Again, here, this is a uh, unprefer. This also has a, a narrow point, and here we just use two coulters behind the behind the shank. Can still be a little bit rough here after just going through there, and especially if the soil is compacted, we can have some cloudiness there. This this is a I guess a farmer made this. He sent me this. Um, this I think is a John Deere, but doesn't matter the, the, the brands, but uh, he, he put these rollers on there, but the, I would have preferred them to be next to the shank if that had been possible, but uh, it's to press the soil back in place and to be able to plant right through that. So that's subsoilers. Now I wanted to say a little bit about um, if you only, say, have to do some surface uh, rearrangement and to, to, to smoothen the field, I... I really like uh, to use a field cultivator for that. They, um, of course, they are very long because to facilitate crop residue flow through the machine, uh, they spaced these uh, little cultivator sweeps are spaced in such a way that you get good flow of residue through the machine. And then we have tines, um, spring tines on the back to... Uh, they, they don't get clogged up with the residue, and uh, they, they create the seed bed. Here we have a close-up of the, of the, um, the sweeps, and you see how they, are how they are arranged so that we have flow of residue through that machine. And here we have the spring time uh, behind it to create our seed bed. So here's an, an another type, but here we have uh, the the sweeps on the cultivator, uh, tine harrow behind it, and also we have a rolling basket to. But you see how much the residue has been reduced already with this only this operation. Rolling basket helps to break up the clots. So that was uh, deep tillage versus surface tillage. Some considerations. I like these field cultivators because they bring the residue to the surface and we get better uh, residue cover than if we use, say, a disc. So then what's next? I think the tillage should not be our end point, but the tillage is just a way of us to open the soil back up and to, to condition it so that we can get our, um, I would like to suggest, start no tillage. So first of all, C, mulch cover. Remember the cover to preserve it. S, soil structure, build soil structure using close spaced crops, cover crops, small grain hay. Think about your crop rotation. How are you going to plant cover crops um, in your crop rotation? It's not easy if you only grow, grow corn and soybeans, but there are a few things that you can do. Think about how you can, can do that. Uh, traffic. We need to manage our traffic. Um, you know, I showed you with continuous no tillage how our soil is more, um, better supports the weight and is more trafficable and we can get on it more. So it's a long term thing that you have to build over time, but it is really a big benefit. And then manage that traffic. To, to avoid um, compacting it. Uh, some of our farmers, they sometimes teach me a lesson. Were, the other day I had a big wake-up call. This last year I did some research on a, one of our board members uh, from the Pennsylvania No-Till Alliance. Uh, we're trying to work on integration of grazing cover crops into his uh, no-till system. He's been long-term no-till and we are evaluating soil health so we're doing infiltration tests. <clears throat> and so we have rings, and then we have to bring water to the rings to, to do the infiltration tests. And his infiltration rate, it was so mind-boggling. So we also did rainfall simulation studies on his farm. We put, we had uh, USDA help us with that. We put down three inches of rain in an hour, and we didn't get any runoff from any of his fields. So three inches in an hour is a lot of water. <laughs> and uh, when we did the rain infiltration, uh, we're still working on it, but it's like, I don't know, 10 inches per hour or something like that. It's crazy. 
Well, we had to bring the water to the rings. So I had my truck with me and I, I got lazy. So I just drove the truck into the field and uh, <laughs> to bring the water to the rings this winter. He said, uh, yeah, I would like to say something, um, a comment. Uh, I don't like you to take your truck into my field. <laughs> because I saw the tracks. He wasn't there when I did it. But I said to my student, uh-oh. When I did it, I said to her, hmm, I'm wondering if uh, he's going to see this because... And you know how these guys are so careful about the management of the salt that it's not for nothing that they have these high infiltration rates. They are very particular about the management of the salt. They're not messing around with doing things when they're not supposed to do it. So manage the traffic. Uh, otherwise, we go in, an, in a vicious spiral of tillage again. After you do the repair, you have to remember your soil is more sensitive to compaction for a while. And that's, that is several years before that goes away. And then the B, biology. Uh, re restore the soil structure, encu encouraging soil biology, using permanent no-tillage, cover crops, deep, think about crop rotation, deep-rooted crops. Organic matter additions. I'm, I know I throw some bombs out here with just, we're so fixated on corn and soybeans, but we need to start thinking about some other ways of doing perhaps crop production and including some other types of crops. We are very blessed because in Pennsylvania we still have a significant uh, dairy industry and uh, therefore we have a lot of more options for our crops with forage crops and alfalfa and hay. So that's, that is a big benefit, I, I recognize that. Now you, you have some dairy here too, so that is a big benefit of having a dairy. All right, so in summary, um, remedial strategies for this year. Fix your fields with appropriate tillage, only if needed, so diagnose it. And, uh, and design a way, a plan for going forward. Uh, I, this might be a good time to consider transitioning to no-till, to permanent no-tillage. Um, we talked about the prevent planted acres, and if there has not been a cover crop planted, we could run into some issues with that uh, shortage of mycorrhizae. That could mean that uh, our phosphorus might be deficient, and uh, perhaps we have to address it. So that. I would keep an eye on that if there are fields that are testing low for phosphorus. Uh, you might show, have a more severe uh, that fellow syndrome showing up. And are you guys going to do some monitoring here, uh, Harold? Or uh, Stephanie, had that. Stephanie, I think some of the uh, right. So this is just such a great privilege that you have. Uh, that you have your extension ed educators here to work with you and to evaluate that and we can learn more together about this because I also don't really have a lot of experience with that at all. Um, soybeans seem to be less affected by this fallow syndrome than corn. So I guess that's a good thing. You guys seem to be growing more soybeans here than corn. So soybeans tend to be less affected. Um, now, another issue is perhaps you can look at growing some shorter day varieties and hybrids to be able to plant cover crops. Well, one benefit is you can harvest them earlier and perhaps you don't have to dry down as much, uh, save some, some drying costs. But um, the other thing is you can plant, think about planting a cover crop there. Um, our, retired uh, agronomist Greg Roth, he did quite a bit of work on evaluating hybrids, shorter season hybrids versus longer season hybrids, and he found that there are some hybrids around that are producing very well, although they're shorter day hybrids. So uh, you don't need to, to use the whole season and try to push it to the limit. You can use some shorter days varieties of corn, and he did most of his work with corn. I don't know about soybeans, but I think uh, there are some options there without sacrificing yield. Try growing small grains. I think I saw in the program there's a talk about wheat, and uh, can we grow wheat profitably? So uh, that can open up some new options for cover crops. 
And then uh, if you do use brassicas, use them only in cover crop mixes. And that is my last slide, so do you guys have any questions for me, I, if I have any time for that? Any questions or comments? Criticisms? Yes? You made a comment that this is more of an art than a science. Yes. What would it take to move this into the science realm more? What information do we need to be studying, replicating, looking at to make this more of a science? Okay, so the question is, uh, I, it's more art, I commented more art and science this, and how can we make it more into science? Um, yes, that's a good question. Well, I, I did think I, it's just this dramatic prevent planting issue has come up as somewhat of a surprise. So I think right now we're, we're gaining a lot of knowledge because, for example, now we're going to evaluate this fellow syndrome. So we're going to take some data and that is going to be available. Um, yeah, some of these things are, I think, still going to stay an art. Uh, it's not because every field is different. So it's something that the farmer will have to evaluate based on a case by case basis the roughness and how deep ruts are and all, all those things are affected by a lot of factors that are perhaps not always that scientifically uh, <laughs> precise. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? If not, then I'm going to hand it over to Harold. Thank you. Thank you.